Ah, 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 ah. Hi everyone, Anthony Fantano here, and it's time for a review of the microphones, the Glow Part 2. Of course, this is a classic review, taking this opportunity to review one of my favorite records of all time. It's about 15 years old at this point, kind of short of the time span that I would usually consider an album to be classic. However, I kind of feel like this one's in the bag. This is too creative and too fantastic of a record for it to be just completely forgotten uh, moving 10 or 20 years into the future. And hopefully I can, I can make the case for this record in, in this review right here. The Microphones is essentially a now defunct recording project started by singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, and producer Mr. Phil Elverum. Now around the time of the release of this record, and just the early years of the Microphones in general, Phil was also known for his involvement with other Washington-based rock bands like D Plus, as well as Old Time Religion, a really fantastic weird fusion of folk and jazz and noise rock, really cool band that I wish sort of got a little more shine. You can even catch some of the microphone songs on the D Plus album Dandelion Seeds. And at this point in the microphone's existence, it is a very different musical project than it is at the point of the release of The Glow Part 2. Go back and listen to the microphone's 1997 release, Wires and Chords, or 1998's Tests. There are a lot of songs whose lyrics deal in, like, recording and recording equipment. Songs like Buzz Buzz and Preamp and Sound Waves. At this point, the microphone's is is kind of a weird experimental musical side project for Phil that kind of reflects his hobbyist approach to home recording a little bit. But over time, as he dabbled in this project, Phil was also developing this kind of quiet, shy, introspective, textured, melodic, and noisy indie folk and rock music that the microphones would come to be known for. He made the almost complete transition into this style on records like Don't Wake Me Up and uh, 2000's It Was Hot, We Stayed in Water, both decent microphones records, but they weren't really the uh, magnum opus that the Glow Part 2 would be. Uh, I think actually the microphones had two magnum opuses, uh, the Glow Part 2 and then later the Mount Erie album that would be the microphones last record before Phil essentially kind of changed this recording project's name to Mount Erie, where I feel like Phil made that full transition into making that really dark lo-fi rock and folk music that was incredibly instrumental, maybe some ambient stuff worked into there as well, and a lot of the lyrics dealing in a lot of these nature themes, which sure that was there in the microphone's music, but I think it's it's kind of pivotal to Mount Erie's identity. identity, identity, identity. Phil continues to drop great music under the Mount Erie name. Some of my favorite albums of his are under that name. And, uh, but still, even though Mount Erie has a very defined sound right now, as does Phil's music just in general, I think uh, he's always transitioning into something. He's always changing up something about the sound or going into a new record with a different concept. Looking back on Phil's entire discography from the microphones to Mount Erie today, it's like his whole back catalog is this endless state of transition or evolution. As much as I like a lot of Phil's music, there's very little about his music that feels whole or complete or very fine-tuned and, and groomed. His music is often very rough around the edges, especially on this album over here. But it's that feel that makes Phil's music so interesting and appealing. While yeah, it may feel a little haphazard in some sense, it may feel a little rough, it may feel a little messy and amateurish, it's also very adventurous and wildly experimental, it takes a lot of risks, it takes a lot of chances. It's very visceral. Not only that, but in the performances and in the mixes of his songs, there are a lot of, I guess, what you could call flubs or mistakes or blemishes or abrupt endings. The music of Phil, Mount Erie, the microphones is, is very unpolished, but it's also very 
uh, unpredictable. The instrumentation on this thing is messy at times. It's uh, disheveled. It's cluttered. The singing is really weak. It's boyish. It's... It's like listening to somebody cry out as they're lost in the middle of a forest and dying of dehydration or starving. But the lyrics on this record are so haunting. They're moving. They're immense. The melodies, they're sweet, they're warm, they're instantaneously just memorable. They stick into the back of my head. I'm humming along with them. And not only are they that, but they're also frightening at times too. And even if the instrumentation does feel a little, you know, rough around the edges at times, the way that the instrumentation is layered on this record, it's really intricate, it's dense. It's wonderful. It feels so arranged and planned and yet kind of unplanned and just barely keeping it together at the same time. This album reminds me of a time when lo-fi music and home recording was kind of like an opportunity to do something weird and do something different. Uh, Phil's approach to arranging and mixing, especially vocals, you could call unorthodox or rule bending. It's strange, but it's so a part of the aesthetic and the musicality and the, the personality of this album. From the very stripped back folky ballads on this record to the crushing distortion of the title track on here at the intro of that song to the towering drones on the song map and the, and the crushing noise rock of the song I Want to Be Cold. There's actually quite a bit of musical diversity across this record. Various forms of rock music and acoustic music and ambient music and piano music show up on this record. Some tracks are incredibly abstract, eye-wideningly weird, while others have some very sharp song structures to them and, and really memorable sing-along choruses. And the sounds worked into these things are, are fantastic, as tattered and as dirty and as grimy as a lot of them are. Just buzzing guitar distortions, warm, resonant, just drony bass, shimmering pianos. Uh, booming drums. And that's just the stuff that's recognizable. There's tons of sounds and miscellaneous noises worked into these tracks that I'm yet to completely figure out and I don't even think could, could ever really be pulled apart unless you were kind of asking Phil or anybody else involved in these recordings about every single minute detail that went into these tracks. And that's the thing about these songs. Again, they're so intricate, they're so layered. On the surface, they sound like a demo and to some, probably a really bad and rough and unappetizing demo. But once you dive into what's going on with these tracks, there's actually quite a bit of detail. There's a level of detail and beauty on this record and on a lot of Microphones records that you wouldn't find on a demo. And it's this disheveled demeanor of these recordings that, that makes the experiments on this record sound so live and in the moment and, and human. The glow isn't just some rough recording pulled together by one person. There's actually quite a bit of personnel on this record including fellow K Records artist and, and D-plus member Carl Blau. There's Kayla Marisic on this record, Kyle Field, Eddie Blau, Nate Ashley, Dave Matthews, Jacob Navarro, Jen Cleese, Leo Visser, and this is actually the most amount of people, I believe, that Phil has had on a microphones record up until this point. No wonder it sounds as huge and as vast as it does. This thing is 20 tracks long, it's about an hour in length, and occasionally there are tracks on here that transition from these very tiny, quaint, indie folk tunes to these panoramic instrumental displays that while they are noisy and things come together in a very cluttered junk pile type of way, they sound very wide, they sound very gorgeous. Tracks like uh, I Felt Your Shape or the track Instrumental where all of a sudden out of nowhere we get these reverb soaked finger snaps and ascending gentle pianos. Let's try to get into what happens on some of these songs individually. Uh, this whole thing kicks off with the song I Want Wind to Blow. This track kicks off with these really great dueling, doubled acoustic guitar melodies with a little bass line popping up in the background that skips along on the tempo that sounds like it's played by the same acoustic guitar. You can expect a lot of this very same acoustic guitar layering to happen throughout this record. This track does a great job of setting the tone for the album in that respect. I love the intimate cracked vocals on this track and a lot of what's popping up on this song lyrically, the wind, the rain, the night, the sun. These are lyrical elements that 
despite the array of different stories told on this record pop up again and again and again and again. This track in particular though feels like a description of very simple surroundings with some beautiful poetry and a lot of natural elements woven in. And the song kind of sounds like in a lot of ways a, a sunrise uh, in a sense. It isn't really the dark and the hellish and, and, and the very uh, solemn soundscape that the last two tracks on this record are, which very much feel like an ending. It's almost like this is the start of a brand new day, and then over the course of this album we are going to be put through a musical ringer, a musical and emotional ringer of sorts across all of these songs. Now this track develops a really beautiful guitar lead melody that the instrumentation builds on with these very hypnotic but distorted drums, and it's a great ending to the track as it transitions into the title track on here. And that's the thing, a lot of the songs on this record flow into one another, making all of the tracks feel very whole and very cohesive. And even the tracks that end abruptly and transition into songs with a totally different flavor, even this disorienting feel kind of adds to the character of the record and keeps things really stimulating. The Glow Part 2 features these crushing, distorted riffs at the start of the track, and then these acoustic guitars break in with this hard heartbreaking little tune that Phil starts singing. Some of the most cutting lyrics on the entire album occur on this track and these very vivid descriptions of his body and his mortality and his blood and his heart pumping that blood appear on this song. Phil's lyrics kind of have this way of putting on display just how fragile and just how finite my mortality and my existence is. His lyrics make me feel like I'm a very tiny, insignificant, just speck of dust in this huge, vast, powerful, dangerous, never-ending world. And the music is as powerful as the lyrics because occurring in the background of these simply strummed acoustic guitars and Phil's vocals, we have this very heavy bass and these pianos that sound like a thunderstorm happening in the distance. On the song The Moon, Phil smothers his vocals once again with these ear-piercing, droning organs and a kind of hypnotic kraut rock-ish drum beat. And there are some wonderful horns woven into this drone as well. The whole track starts off though with a really stringy, crunchy, layered, uh, arpeggiated acoustic guitar intro that I like a lot. I think the guitars on here have a really specific tone and flavor to them. They're buzzing, they're stringy. Each chord and each note is like stepping onto a bed of crunchy, dry, dead leaves as you walk through a forest. The song Headless Horseman is one of this album's many very somber acoustic ballads, which make up for some of my favorite tracks on the entire record, like the song I'll Not Contain You, which is way more piano-driven, or the track You'll Be In The Air. But on this track, it's one of the songs that I think is maybe a little breakup or relationship-oriented. I'm catching lyrics on this song talking about uh, standing outside and all of his stuff is out side as if it had been moved out of an apartment or something and he's talking about returning from hell and turning from a stray dog to a mighty human man it's another one of the moments on this record where phil's lyrics are are really interesting and symbolic and uh, i guess intriguing while they describe a very personal real moment. They're esoteric but relatable at the same time. And I love the little piano ballad, My Roots Are Strong and Deep, as well. I think the descriptive poetry on this track is really sweet as well. Phil talking about how uh, he's like this tree-type figure and he's swaying in this other person's breeze. From the song The Mansion to Something to Something Continued, we have these kind of dreary interlude ish tracks that are very drone heavy. The mansion has these fluttering acoustic guitars playing throughout and this really repetitive, somber, stone-faced poetry coming from Phil while something continued is very dissonant. It's very ominous and unsettling drone music. Very different vibe from the Gleam Part 2 which has this really prominent percussive element to it. It's just plotting. It's like a funeral march. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. That track and the song Map are two of the most immense songs on the entire record as far as just 
emotional anguish goes. And I love how multifaceted this track is, not only with its heavy, intense drones at the very start of the track, but also the piano melody it suddenly breaks into in the in the middle of the track. Bum, bun, dun, 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 dun. And that pump organ or that accordion at the end, those long droney chords, those airy droney chords at the finish of this track, really nice touch. Then comes the amazingly loud I Wanna Be Cold, which I mentioned earlier in this review, and the song I Am Bored, which has maybe the loveliest piano. No, 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 no. Dun, 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 dun. Those chords right there, uh, not only are they really warm and fun and, and, and very cool, uh, but they also remind me of like some older vocal pop or something. Phil really borrowing from something else on that track right there, but still turning it into something all his own. And these pianos, his vocals, the, the kind of rolling drums uh, on the floor tom on this track, uh, it's something that has a really strong amateurish charm to it. Uh, but again, it's another one of those moments where everything feels a little too planned to be completely just, you know, oh, we don't know what we're doing, especially during the roaring bridge on this track, where all of a sudden this very gentle little piano tune turns into like this uh, roaring tornado of hell for a second. From the song I Felt My Size to the track I Felt Your Shape, Phil writes two of his sharpest songs, not only on this record, but on his entire discography, really great choruses on this song, some incredibly cutting emotional and moving lyrics, especially on I Felt Your Shape, where I think Phil pulls out one of the sharpest, coolest acoustic guitar licks I've ever heard on any record. Something that I remember when I first heard it, uh, I had to learn it, and I didn't even know if there were any tabs out or anything for it. I just completely taught myself at least some kind of weird, recognizable version of the song on acoustic guitar uh, because I just thought the song was, was that good. I just had to force myself to learn it by ear uh, <laughs> just off of uh, just being first exposed to it. I just was, was that uh, floored by how good the song was. And that's another thing about this record in, in general. It's kind of one of those albums that <clears throat> uh, it reminds me a little bit of the Velvet Underground in that the Velvet Underground <clears throat> had this quality to their music where it was just deceptively simple and, and amateurish to the point where you would think that if you picked up an instrument and, and got together with three or four other people and started some awful rock band that, that you'd be just as great as the Velvet Underground. The thing about Mount Erie, though, is that <laughs> uh, the music is so beautiful and wonderful and the recording itself is so deceptively uh, rough and uh, I guess bad uh, by traditional standards that it would make you think that you could pull together some kind of lo-fi home recorded folk album and it would be just as amazing and creative and just off the wall. Now the song Samurai Sword, one of the final tracks on this record, as I mentioned toward the beginning of this review, is really hellish. It's really loud. It's kind of like Phil coming in observing everything he's built up until this point for 50 or so minutes on this record, and then just toppling it and destroying it and just throwing it all into the toilet. It's uh, sort of like a hurricane that just clears the entire slate of this record. It's kind of like the hellish wind that Phil wanted to blow at the beginning of the album, coming in and just erasing everything, while the final track to me kind of sounds like Phil dealing with death. At the beginning of this album, Phil is singing about uh, electric heat and fluorescent light and a load of other things. Uh, but here, he's singing about the power being out and it being night and the sun is going down and it's dark and he's alone except for like some insects or something. And this song is very long, it's nine minutes or so, although he's just kind of playing a bit of piano at the intro and then breaks into this acoustic cut for a few moments just to kind of paint the situation, just kind of give you an idea of the imagery that he's surrounded by. And then the song cuts out entirely and all we here is this lone drum that kind of sounds like a heartbeat which eventually just goes silent. I'm to guess that maybe that means he's dead at this point. Just death is there. Nothingness. It's black. And then after that, aside from a drone that pops up occasionally, the song is completely silent. Very faintly in the background, I kind of hear the acoustic guitar melody that 
uh, was on the very first track to this album, uh, I Want Wind to Blow. The melody is occurring just so faintly, it's kind of deceptive. You might think that you were coming up with it in your own head out of boredom, just from nothing happening at this point in the song. But I'm, um, again, to guess that the silence at this point in the track, and the fact that we do have this reference to the beginning of this record, that they're connected thematically or story-wise in some kind of way, that, that the life and that the newness and that the brightness that was there at the beginning of this album is now gone as a result of either the wind coming or nature destroying everything or just kind of the death or the finite mortality that has been referenced throughout this album up until this point. It's a great record. I think it's a fantastic record. It's experimental, it's avant folk, singer-songwriter, noise rock, indie. I mean, there's just so much stuff going on here. There's so many elements, so many different musical styles woven into this record. It's so dynamic, so many different emotions and, and things expressed across this album. Although, again, a lot of it deals with life and death and mortality and uh, incredible emotional pain. And I feel like there are very few albums of the 2000s that that go into those issues as well as this album does. And with so much character too, not only with the instrumentation and the production on this thing, but I think Phil's attraction toward a lot of these natural themes and uh, backdrops gives his music uh, a bit of an edge, or at least a very unique characteristic that, that doesn't turn up in a lot of other records, or at least when it does, it doesn't seem anywhere near as authentic or organic. I don't really think I could say much of anything else about this album. I'm, I'm just floored by it every time that I, thankfully, get an opportunity to really sit down and listen to it and remind myself of why I continue to love it so much after all these years, and I hope you guys uh, take the opportunity to give this album a listen to and try it for yourself and just basically see what all the hubbub is about. Cool? Cool. I love you. Transition! Have you given this record a listen? If you have, let me know what you think of it. Is it one of your favorites of all time? Is it not? Let me know. Anthony Fantano, The Glow, Part 2, Forever.